Hello and welcome to Unacademy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. A very good morning and welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. So let's begin the discussion by first looking at the topics that we are going to discuss. From the international edition of the Hindu, I have chosen seven important articles for a detailed analysis. There are two articles that are very important for the mains examination and few smaller articles that are important for the prelims exam. Especially the first article that deals with India's nuanced approach on the South China Sea dispute is very interesting and very important. And even the article dealing with gold prices is going to be very important for mains and as well as for prelims. So let's analyze all these topics one by one and let's ensure that it's a comprehensive discussion. The idea is to ensure that you don't have to go back and read the newspaper again. If you guys are liking these initiatives, do support us with your likes, your comments and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Now before we start today's discussion, we have a couple of very, very big announcements. UPSC has recently announced the 2023 results and Unacademy is, is very proud to claim that a number of our students have topped the exam. We have four top rankers within the top 10, around 11 learners in top 20 and a total of 320 plus results from Unacademy IAS courses. To be very transparent here, out of the total 320 learners who in directly or indirectly were part of Unacademy's courses, around 66 of them were classroom online and offline program students. Around 95 of them have used the Unacademy platform, especially for the free special classes. And more than 150 students have benefited from our last mile program, that is the interview guidance program. Now we know that there are many more students who may not have cleared the exam. There are many more who are aspiring to prepare for civil services and crack this elite exam. So to help all of you, we are coming out with a massive price discount on our IAS courses. It's the biggest ever price drop. Because we used to receive a number of messages from existing students and even from uh, other aspirants that the courses sometimes can be unaffordable, uh, especially if you look at India's diverse uh, population. So keeping in mind these requests, Unacademy's management has decided to provide a massive price discount and this is a limited time offer. The offer ends on 21st of April and from 75,000 the prices have been dropped to 29,999. Now the best part is that this offer is available not just for the new students who are going to enroll, it is available even for our existing students because you stand to get a three month extension. Basically, even if you're a paid learner already, let's say you have already subscribed to our plus or iconic program, right? If you can make use of the offer, you will get a 15 month plus three month extension at this price. So those who have not been able to clear the exam, those who want to continue for another attempt, right? You get a much reasonable offer here. So at this price, you get a 15 month course with a three month free extension. So all those students, right, who are, who are looking to crack the exam, do ensure that you uh, make use of this offer. So these are the various IAS batches that are starting in English, Hindi and bilingual as well. And more importantly, we have optional courses starting very soon from April 22nd. So do contact the number provided on the screen and you will get further details. Now, before we start, there is another big announcement because today we are launching Conca Prelims 2024. We have seen many of you commenting that, sir, please start a crash course to help us prepare for the upcoming prelims. We know that it's very difficult to revise all the static topics and as well as the current affairs of the last one year. So to help you, we are launching a free crash course. It is absolutely free because we have been announcing this from a couple of days and students were asking whether it's free or not. The crash course is absolutely free. Now let me break down the details for you. Conquer Prelims 2024 will have two phases, static and current affairs. So phase one begins from today. That is the static discussion begins from today from 19th April and these classes are exclusively held on the Unacademy app. So you have to download the Unacademy app 
and the classes will be held from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. every day till 7th of June. So a total of 50 classes will be covered. Around 500 important static topics will be uh, revised through MCQ based discussion so that you get to practice questions as well. Then the second phase will start from 1st of May, which is the current affairs phase. These sessions will be held right here on our YouTube channel from 1st May every day from 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. So the current affairs phase of the crash course will continue till 31st May. So total of 31 classes covering all important subjects, including reports and indices, places in news, and even India yearbook. So it's a very comprehensive course. You can take a look at the split of the classes as well. And I've added the schedule for your convenience. You can download this PPT. It's the link is available in the description box below. And also the schedule has been uploaded in the community section of our YouTube channel and also on our telegram channel. So from today, phase one of Conquer prelims will begin. And Sarmad Mehrad sir will be starting with Indian polity today at 6 p.m. live on the Unacademy app. So all you have to do is download the app and follow the respective teachers, follow their profiles. And also the links are provided in the video description. So do attend these classes and please ensure you attend the classes live. Don't think that you will watch them later. Of course, recorded sessions will be available both uh, in the static part and in the current affairs part. But if you do that, you will end up procrastinating, right? Then later you might repent. So this is an opportunity for you to easily revise close to 1000 topics through 1000 MCQs from both static and current affairs. So it's a great opportunity for you. So please make use of it and ensure that you attend the class live today from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. and from 1st May from 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. on our YouTube channel. So let's begin with today's discussion by looking at this important column on page number eight. In this article, the writers, Harshvi Pant and uh, another writer, they are talking about India's nuanced position on the South China Sea dispute. So let's explore this topic in great detail because it's very, very important given how India has evolved its position over the South China Sea conflict. So first, let's understand where is South China Sea located. Let's understand the significance of South China Sea and also talk about the nature of the dispute present over here. And then we will discuss how India gets affected by the South China Sea dispute. We'll also talk about China's uh, aggressive behavior, right? And what has India done with regard to the ongoing South China Sea conflict. So all these points will be discussed in detail. So if you look at the map here, South China Sea is located in Southeast Asia. It's one of the most important water bodies in the world as it connects the Indian Ocean with the Pacific Ocean. It is a very important sea lane of communication. It's a very important shipping route, essentially. It's a critical trading route. And a large part of global trade and even global oil shipments passes through the South China Sea. I'm sure all of you know that in today's world, it is the Indo-Pacific region which has become the hub of the global economy and global geopolitics. All the biggest diplomatic developments, all the biggest economic developments, right? They're all taking place here in the Indo-Pacific. If you go back a few decades ago, let's say uh, during the Cold War, before 1990s, back then the Atlantic Ocean or areas around, in and around the Atlantic, those regions were the hub of the global economy and global geopolitics because all the major powers were centered around the Atlantic. But in the last three decades, we have seen a major power shift, a power shift from the West to the East. We have seen the rise of the Asian powers led by India, China, all the Southeast and East Asian economies. And parallelly, we have seen a decline of European powers. So the global focus has today shifted towards the Indo-Pacific. And if you observe closely, you will notice that South China Sea is at the very heart of the Indo-Pacific. It is a critical water body, a very important trading route, a sea lane of communication that connects the Indian Ocean with the Pacific Ocean. And South China Sea is blessed with great resources as well. It is believed to have 
hydrocarbon reserves, precious minerals including rare earth elements, polymetallic nodules present on the sea floor, plus it has fisheries. So it's a resource rich water body. So it's not only of great economic importance, it is also of great strategic significance. So no wonder countries are competing to claim the territory here. See, when it comes to maritime boundaries and jurisdictions, we have an international convention, which is part of international law, that defines these boundaries and jurisdictions. This is nothing but the UN clause or the UN convention on the law of the sea. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea defines the extent of the maritime boundaries, including territorial waters, contiguous zone, exclusive economic zone, etc. It defines the jurisdiction of the coastal states as well in these uh, boundaries. And according to UN clause provisions, all the resources present in the EZ of a country belongs to that country alone. Usually, the exclusive economic zone of a nation extends up to 200 nautical miles. It extends up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline, from the reference line that is drawn along the coastline of that nation. So usually, in general, EZ of a country extends up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline. This could vary as well if many countries are packed into a tight uh, sea or a ocean then every country will not be able to get such a large EEZ, right? But some countries might have an extended continental shelf. Their continental shelf might extend beyond 200 nautical miles. So those countries can even provide the evidence to show that the continental shelf is extending beyond 200 nautical miles and ask for an extension of their EEZ. It can be extended up to 350 nautical miles as well. But in general, EZ of a nation is up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline. Sometimes it can be less as well, depending on the geography. And it can be increased up to 350 nautical miles if the continental shelf extends beyond 200 nautical miles. Now, whatever resources are present here, be it the hydrocarbon reserves, fisheries, minerals, all the economic resources belong to that coastal state. Another country cannot poach, cannot exploit those resources. Is that clear? So this is where it becomes very important to examine the current situation in South China Sea. See, as per UN clause provisions, the EZ of all the countries present here has been clearly marked, be it the Southeast Asian countries, be it China, right? Their EZs, they are supposed to be clearly defined. But however, China has unilaterally claimed almost the entire South China Sea to itself. Based on historical claims that Chinese empires ruled and dominated South China Sea hundreds of years ago, right? China has discarded the international rules. It has disobeyed the international law and it has unilaterally claimed most of the South China Sea to itself. So China has drawn a line for this purpose, which is called the nine dash line. In this image, you can see a U-shaped line, the red dotted line. You can see that there are nine dashes that are used. Previously, it was the 11 dash line, 10 dash line. Now it is called the nine dash line because nine dashes are used in a U-shape to mark China's claims of EEZ in South China Sea. China claims that this nine dash line represents the exclusive economic zone of China. But this claim of China is in contradiction to UN clause provisions. It is against the international rules-based order. Why? Because it directly overlaps with the EEZ of many other countries. As per UN clause, Vietnam's EEZ extends till here. As per UN clause, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Brunei, they're all supposed to get a large share of the EEZ. But China is unilaterally claiming most of the EEZ present here to itself by drawing this imaginary line, the nine dash line. And China has gotten aggressive, not just diplomatically, but even through military methods 
it has gotten very aggressive in South China Sea, challenging the claims of the other countries. It has disobeyed the international rules, threatened all the countries here, and thus it has triggered the South China Sea dispute. So it's for obvious reasons. Given how important South China Sea is for the global economy, given its strategic significance, right? Obviously, China wants to control and dominate large parts of the South China Sea. So this directly affects the sovereignty of multiple countries in Southeast Asia. And a similar behavior is shown by China in the East China Sea as well. Even in the East China Sea with uh, Japan, China shows a similar behavior where it is claiming islands that are supposed to belong to Japan. Now let's understand which are these islands as well because there can be a prelims question here, a map based question. Now here you can see the parasol group of islands, right? This is supposed to belong to Vietnam, large part of parasol islands, it's a group of islands. It's supposed to belong to Vietnam, but China is claiming it. So this has led to a direct standoff, a direct dispute between China and Vietnam. Then can you see the Spratly group of islands? It's a large group of islands present in South China Sea, the Spratly group of islands. It is supposed to belong to Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia as well. Even Vietnam is party to it. Philippines is also party to it. So they all get a share of the Spratly Islands, but not China. But what China has done, it has dismissed the claims, the genuine claims of all the other countries violated their sovereignty and unilaterally claimed the entire Spratly Island group for itself. China even has a separate bilateral dispute with Indonesia over Natuna Island. There is another small island located here called Natuna Island, which is supposed to belong to Indonesia. But China claims Natuna Island as well. Then coming to Philippines, China has been very aggressive against Philippines with regard to multiple islets and shoals present over here. For example, at Mischief Reef and First and Second Thomas Shoal, the First Thomas Shoal and Second Thomas Shoal. These are very important locations for your exams as well because they are frequently in news. Because every now and then there is a confrontation that occurs here between Chinese forces and uh, the naval forces of Philippines. Even with Natuna, Natuna Island as well, even that island is frequently in news. The Chinese Navy, Chinese Coast Guard and uh, the Chinese Air Force, they have been very aggressive in these areas. They even target the fishing vessels. For example, near Natuna Island and near uh, Second Thomas Shoal, the Chinese Navy and Coast Guard, the PLA Navy and the Coast Guard, they have sunk the fishing vessels of the other countries. They have threatened other naval vessels and aircrafts. They have disrupted the freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight. China has deliberately disrupted freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight. See, in international waters, any vessel, any aircraft has the right to navigate and pass through. This is an international right, a fundamental right guaranteed under the UN clause. This is part of the rules-based international order created under UN clause. So it's part of international law. That freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight is a basic right. It can't be denied. But China has disrupted the movement of vessels and aircraft and it has threatened the countries. It has militarized the region. It has even built artificial islands over here to just enhance its claims and create a military bases from where it can threaten the other countries. With Japan as well, over Senkaku Diayu Islands, China has been very aggressive in the East China Sea threatening Japanese interests. Now in this map, you can notice this small shoal called Scarborough Shoal. The Scarborough Shoal belongs to Philippines. But China has been claiming this and it has been very aggressive against Philippines in this regard. Now, 
in 2016, Philippines took this case to the international tribunal. It took the matter to the international tribunal, which is the permanent court of arbitration in this case. As per UN clause provisions, according to UN clause, any maritime disputes can be settled through the international tribunal on the law of the sea. Or you can approach uh, arbitration bodies like PCA, Permanent Court of Arbitration. So Philippines filed a case against China seeking arbitration from PCA over the Scarborough, Scarborough Shoal dispute. So in this case, the PCA passed a historic award. It ruled in favor of Philippines. It said that Scarborough Shoal belongs to Philippines as per UN clause provisions and it urged China to give up its claims. It urged China to stop being aggressive and violating international law and it urged China to respect the award. But China dismissed the PCA award. China said it's not obligated to follow the PCA award and it dismissed the, the final award that was delivered. So this has been China's uh, behavior in South China Sea, which has threatened the interests of multiple countries. Now, some of you might be wondering, why did I go on in so much detail about this topic? Trust me, it is very, very relevant because there are Indian interests involved. I'll give you one very interesting uh, example, uh, incident that happened a few years ago. Under the then Manmohan Singh government, almost a decade ago, India-Vietnam had built very strong relations. Very strong economic defense relations were being built. And Vietnam had invited India for joint oil exploration in Vietnam's EEZ, near the Paracel Islands. So India was obviously very eager to explore the opportunity because we are looking for energy resources um, anywhere it's available. And India's ONGC Videsh Limited, OVL, which is involved in uh, overseas oil projects, right? It deployed its vessels as a joint uh, collaborative initiative with Vietnam to explore the oil potential near Paracel Islands. And these OVL vessels from India were escorted by the Indian Navy. Indian naval vessels were also dispatched and these Indian vessels along with Vietnam were jointly exploring the area. So this is well within Vietnam's rights. It is part of Vietnam's sovereignty. So Vietnam can invite any other partner, any other country it wants. But when the joint exploration was being done, the PLA Navy intercepted the exploration activity and they threatened the Indian naval vessels. They directly threatened India to quit and leave the region as they claimed this to be Chinese territory. So that has been the extent of China's disruption in South China Sea. And also please remember, a large part of India's trade, our exports, imports, passes through South China Sea. So if the situation escalates and turns into another conflict, right, this would have a huge economic impact on India. India gets a lot of imports through this route, including oil imports, which is crucial for our energy security. We export a lot of goods and commodities through this route, which is absolutely vital for the Indian economy. So any conflict, any escalation here will directly impact the Indian economy. So there are economic interests involved. We also have very good diplomatic and strategic relations with these Southeast Asian countries. So India as a responsible global power, right, will be expected to play a stabilizing role to put pressure on China and to stabilize the region and prevent a possible conflict. And also don't forget, India, China have a, a similar territorial dispute, a land border dispute in the Himalayas. We have seen a similar behavior from China with regard to our boundary dispute as well, China gets unnecessarily aggressive against India. And it, and it has repeatedly threatened India's sovereignty. We recently saw during uh, the Galwan River Valley clashes, the Ladakh uh, standoff, which is still going on. The Doklam dispute involving Bhutan a few years ago. So China has repeatedly carried out incursions into our territory and threatened the sovereignty of India. So a similar expansionist aggressive behavior is being seen here as well. And obviously, if India takes a stand on this, it could be a potential opportunity to push China back. Given that we have a similar boundary dispute, a territorial boundary dispute, we can leverage this maritime dispute to push China back, to put pressure on China. So there are multiple interests for India here. Now, until recently, until a few years ago, 
let's say until 2015, 2016, India was largely neutral on the South China Sea issue. We wouldn't directly support the Southeast Asian countries, neither would we criticize China directly. But however, when China got aggressive, we would urge China and demand China to respect international law. Right? India would demand that freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight should be protected and we would demand that China should respect international law and the rules-based order. But beyond that, India wouldn't take a direct stand on this issue because we didn't want to trigger China or instigate China. But now things have changed in the last seven years or eight years. Because of China's aggression against India and the deterioration in India-China relations, it has become important for India to counter the Chinese aggression as well. Especially since the Doklam crisis and the recent Ladakh uh, clashes, it has become important for India to to take this as a, as a personal matter and get closer to Southeast Asian countries and support them directly with regard to the South China Sea dispute. So what the writers are saying is that our policy on South China Sea dispute has evolved. We are seeing a very big evolution, a very big change happening in our policy and they refer to this as a nuanced approach of India. A very well thought out balanced approach of India from largely a neutral position to a proactive position today, India's approach has definitely changed over the South China Sea issue. Now, how is this evident? Are there any examples? Recently, India's Foreign Minister Dr. Jai Shankar visited Philippines. And during this visit, India extended full support to Philippines, direct support to Philippines and its position. And also don't forget, we have signed a defense contract with Philippines to export the BrahMos cruise missile. The naval variant of the BrahMos cruise missile is being exported from India to Philippines. BrahMos is known for its uh, accuracy and it's one of the fastest cruise missiles in the world. So the decision to export BrahMos to Philippines is a big escalation from India. China will see this as a hostile move, right? So, India has built closer defense and strategic relations with these countries, right? And we are taking a more proactive approach on this dispute as well, because it serves multiple interests for India. So, let's examine these interests and that would be the end of our discussion. So, essentially, the point here is, China is showing no respect to the rules-based order. It hardly cares about international rules, it's breaking down international law. Right? This is something India cannot tolerate. Right? As a regional power, as a global power, we would expect stability. We would expect uh, peace and, and stability in the region. Plus, it is Indian friends like Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, who are very close partners for India, who are getting affected. So it becomes important for India to stand by them, to extend a kind of support, so that our relations with these Southeast Asian countries can improve. Right? At the same time, as I told you, it's an opportunity for us to push China back, right, directly or indirectly, and create so a sort of connection between the territorial dispute we have and the maritime dispute happening in South China Sea. So what India has done is that its position has clearly departed from the previous neutral position. Previously, as I told you, we were largely neutral. We would condemn any aggressive action. We would urge China to follow the international rules, but nothing beyond that. We wouldn't take a direct position against China. But now, because of China's aggression, because of repeated uh, border incursions and repeated threats by China, India's position has evolved in the last four to five years. We are more proactive in the region as well, and we are changing our stand on the South China Sea issue. So now India has directly extended support to Philippines, and we might see the same happening with other countries as well. So the reason behind this is largely because of the centrality of the ASEAN group. ASEAN is a regional grouping. It's a regional grouping of 10 Southeast Asian countries and India has built very good relations with these Southeast Asian countries. Since 1991, since we started the Look East policy under Prime Minister Narsimha Rao, since then India has built very strong relations with Southeast Asian countries and now we are further improving those relations under the Act East policy launched by the Modi government. So given the centrality of ASEAN and how important ASEAN countries are for the Indo-Pacific, it is natural for India to stand with 
the Southeast Asian countries. Because India has major stakes in the Indo-Pacific. As I told you, Indo-Pacific is, is what uh, is considered as the global hub today for all the big economic and geopolitical developments. So India has formed few groupings as well, such as the Quad, the Quadrilateral, which is an informal diplomatic grouping of US, Japan and Australia. So these four countries have urged every country to follow the international rules and protect the rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific. So India has aligned with global powers as well, like-minded democracies like US, Japan and Australia to enforce a rules-based order. And we have expanded our influence across the Indo-Pacific and we know that ASEAN region, Southeast Asian countries are central to this region. If India has to expand its influence further towards the Pacific, we can't do that without the help of the ASEAN countries. Right? We have major economic ties, cultural and even defense and strategic relations with these ASEAN nations. So that is one reason why you see a major shift happening in Indian policy towards South China Sea. From look east to act east, India has become more proactive when it comes to defense and strategic relations. Under the look east policy, the focus was largely on building economic and cultural relations. Economic and cultural ties were very well promoted under Lukey's policy from 1991 till 2014. From 91 to 2014, economic and cultural ties were, were, were built um, between India and Southeast Asian countries. Defense and strategic relations, even though they were, they were being promoted, it was not the prime focus back then. But now given China's aggression and our focus on the larger Indo-Pacific region, these priorities have shifted for India. Under the Act East policy since 2014, we are not only focused on the strong economic and cultural ties, but we are more proactive in our defense and strategic relations as well. This is a very, very important point that explains the change in India's position. We have built very good defense relations with the ASEAN countries over the last few years under Act East policy. Be it Singapore, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand. With all of them, we conduct military exercises. Indian naval vessels, Coast Guard vessels, they frequently visit the ports of these countries. From Philippines to uh, Indonesia, from uh, let's say Vietnam to uh, Malaysia, Thailand. We work very closely with all these countries in the defense domain and in fact, India is trying to project its military power, particularly its naval power into South China Sea as a counter to Chinese aggression. For example, when the Galwan clashes were taking place in Ladakh, parallelly, Indian Navy was dispatched into South China Sea to show India's intent to extend the tensions if required, even into South China Sea. As China was pressurizing India at Ladakh, right, as the Galwan crisis was erupting, Indian naval vessels were deployed in South China Sea in a proactive deployment to show that India has military reach even in South China Sea to counter China. Right? So this explains India's changed approach towards the entire Indo-Pacific and that is why today India is directly supporting countries like Philippines with regard to the dispute. So this is the big change. This is the evolution that you are witnessing in India's uh, position on South China Sea dispute. So that is the point that the writers were highlighting. Because see, this will serve our interests in every possible way. It will bring us closer to ASEAN countries. It will further improve our economic and defense relations with them. Right? We might get an opportunity to export uh, more weapons to other countries, which could be good for India's defense industry. Right? Plus, in a way, India gets an opportunity to counter China. If China can uh, use Pakistan to counter India, India can work with Southeast Asian countries to counter China in its own backyard. Right? If China can meddle in Indian Ocean, in South Asia, India can meddle in South China Sea to counter uh, the Chinese aggression. Plus, it positions India as a responsible power, a regional and global power, which is looking for stability in the region. So it serves multiple purposes for India, and that is the reason why we have seen this evolution happening in Indian foreign policy. So this is the important point that the writers bring out through this column.
Now let's look at the next article from page 13, which is equally interesting and very important for economy and even for international relations. The article is focused on the record prices of gold. So I'm sure all of you, especially if you're a gold enthusiast, right? Indians can be gold enthusiasts, right? I'm sure you would have noticed that gold prices have hit record levels, more than 7,100 rupees per gram. And it has remained quite consistent in the last few weeks. So what explains this rally in gold prices? Is there any connection with what's happening around us? That is what the article is exploring. And I feel it's a very important article. Given all the geopolitical and economic developments, right? There could be a question on the prices of gold, how it is connected to crude oil prices, geopolitical events, and more importantly, how is it linked to the value of the US dollar? There is a correlation that exists between prices of gold, prices of crude oil, and the value of the US dollar. Understanding this correlation is a very important concept, both for economy and international relations. So in recent weeks, gold prices have surged. It has remained at record levels. So it's very crucial to understand the influences, the reasons behind the rise in gold prices and understand the correlation that exists with crude oil prices and the value of the US dollar. So please write down this point as I explain. First, let's talk about prices of gold and crude oil. When you compare the two, you will notice that there is a positive correlation that exists. What does it mean? It means if oil prices rise, gold prices will also rise. If oil prices decline, gold prices will also decline. So there is a direct relationship. There is a, a direct proportional relationship that exists between prices of gold and oil. When oil prices shoot up due to, let's say, geopolitical um, challenges or let's say due to demand supply mismatch in the oil market, as oil prices shoot up, gold prices will also shoot up. So what explains this? Let's understand the explanation behind it. When oil prices shoot up, it triggers the fear of inflation. I've added this point in the next slide as well the risk of inflation increases, right? Because increase in oil prices will affect the global economy. It will increase the transportation cost, the logistics cost. It will increase uh, the cost in the industry. All the fossil fuel dependent industries, their costs will shoot up, right? So eventually it will translate, it will trickle down uh, to the consumer level, causing widespread inflation in the economy. So inflation hurts the currency. Your currency will lose value, right? So that is when investors become very cautious. When there is an inflation risk due to rising oil prices, they want to hedge themselves or protect themselves against the risk of inflation. They want to protect the value of their assets. So what do they do? They dump every other asset and they all run towards gold. Because gold is a real asset, a tangible asset. So gold is an asset that is that is not going to lose its value. Prices might fluctuate, but eventually, because of its limited supply, gold will not lose value. It has been a, a reserve a asset for, for centuries, for millenniums. So whenever there is a significant risk of inflation due to rising oil prices, investors, they dump every other asset and rush towards gold because it gives them a hedge, a buffer, a protection against inflation. And that is the reason why there is a direct correlation between prices of gold and prices of crude oil. Now, let's look at the link between prices of gold and US dollar. Let's see how those two are connected. Because today, US dollar is the reserve currency, right? After the oil crisis of 1970s, that, that's the, the one reason why US dollar became the reserve currency later. Until then, gold was seen as the global reserve. But given the massive oil crisis in the 70s and how uh, gold prices fluctuated and how it impacted the economy, right? There was a push towards using the most stable currency from the most stable economy as a reserve currency, that is the US dollar. But there does exist a direct link between the dollar and the gold prices. But however, it's a negative correlation. 
there is a inverse relationship it's a inversely proportional relationship so if dollar depreciates if dollar loses its value gold prices will shoot up and vice versa that is the general trend understood so let me explain why this occurs why this happens see when dollar loses its value right so all those who are dependent on the dollar let's say governments banks institutions investors who are all holding us dollar because it's the global reserve currency right they will lose value the currency loses value so what they do they junk a part of the dollar assets and shift towards gold so the value of gold goes up as dollar depreciates understood so there is a inverse relationship a negative correlation here but now there is something very interesting that is happening see as of now gold prices are at its maximum so what would you expect because there is a negative correlation you obviously expect the dollar to have depreciated correct but that has not happened dollar remains at a higher value you look at the uh, exchange rate of the indian rupee to dollar right it's i think it's somewhere around 83 uh, rupees per dollar so dollar value has not depreciated but still gold prices has shot up oil prices definitely has shot up so what we understood is that the direct correlation the positive correlation between gold and oil right which we understood as a theory even in real life we are seeing the same trend right now oil prices are at extreme high levels gold prices are also at very high levels so that is correct what we are seeing is exactly as what we understood in theory but there is a aberration happening right now with regard to gold and dollar prices theory says that gold and dollar have a negative relationship it's a inverse relationship a negative correlation gold prices if they are high it means dollar should be losing value but that's not happening exactly dollar value remains higher and at the same time gold prices also remain higher so what's causing this aberration let's understand that so to understand the aberration that's happening between the prices of gold and value of dollar first you have to understand what other factors could influence the price of the gold see it's not just oil prices and dollar value which influences gold prices that is one of the factors right when oil prices go up inflation risk is what pushes everyone towards gold right similarly when dollar loses value they want to protect their assets they move towards gold so that is one factor there are other factors as well the demand supply equation obviously the supply demand factors of gold will affect gold prices because see gold is a precious resource it has always been a limited resource and we have already exploited most of the gold available today very few countries produce gold and as of now countries have to dig deeper they have to mine deeper literally going to the bowels of the earth to mine gold and as a result mining has become very expensive it's labor intensive it is risky and very very expensive to mine fresh gold there are supply side constraints that is the point because most of the gold available which was already a limited resource has been exploited many countries have already run out of their gold reserves whatever is left is very minimal and you have to dig deeper you have to increase your mining cost your labor cost it consumes a lot of energy right so it's not easy to produce new gold basically to mine new gold so this is one major supply side constraint now let's look at the demand what are the demand factors how does demand affect the prices this is a very important understanding because there are there is a demand for gold from different quarters there is a institutional demand from central banks and governments central banks even governments they buy up gold they hold gold reserves investors invest in gold as derivatives and various gold based products consumers you and me we buy gold either due to uh, traditional uh, customary purposes or emotional value right whatever it is consumers buy gold in certain countries and there is a huge industrial demand so there are multiple uh, stakeholders who raise demand for gold first and foremost it's your central banks the rbi the us federal reserve european central bank the central banks they are the biggest buyers of gold 
whatever they do with regard to gold reserves, right, it has a direct impact on the gold market. Right now, the institutional demand has shot up. Central banks are rushing to buy more gold, especially Central Bank of China. Why? Because central banks and governments are expecting a major crisis to hit us, given the geopolitical uncertainties which is affecting the world. Be it the Russia-Ukraine war, which has been going on for two years, the war in West Asia, the Gaza war, and the latest tensions between Iran and Israel. Right? A few days ago, Iran attacked uh, Israel, and today morning, just a few minutes before I started, there have been reports that Israel has most likely struck Iran with possible missiles or drones. So it's still a developing story. So there is every possibility of a war breaking out between Iran and Israel. So due to these geopolitical tensions and uncertainties, central banks are worried. They're worried about the liquidity situation, about inflation, right? They're worried about uh, growth. Governments are concerned. So everybody is stocking up on gold. It is something that everyone accumulates during emergencies or for emergencies. Because gold is seen as a hedge, a buffer, a last resort asset which never loses its value. You might have seen your parents, your grandparents telling you that always invest in real estate or gold. That's the best investment for you, right? Today, we might have a different thinking on investments, but this statement is very true. Gold as, as one of the best asset classes is, is undisputable. Governments and central banks rush to buy gold whenever there is a crisis. So this is what is happening. The institutional demand has shot up. Especially China is building up massive reserves. Right? Central banks, if they try to print new currency, they back it up with gold. To issue new currency, they accumulate gold reserves to create the, the intrinsic value for the currency. So central banks are the biggest buyers of gold. So what they do directly affects the gold prices. And right now, they are buying more gold because of the uncertainties. Next, investor demand. Investors, be it individual retail investors or institutional investors, right? There are many gold-based products. You have gold derivatives, you have uh, ETFs, exchange-traded uh, funds based on gold, right? So there are many gold-based uh, products in the capital market, which is, which is a major driver of demand for gold. Then consumer demand, especially for ornamental purposes, jewelry uh, purposes, especially in India, in China as well. In many traditions, right, gold has a lot of religious, cultural significance. From festivals to marriages to events, gold is used everywhere. But this, however, is a seasonal demand. Consumer demand is seasonal. right? During wedding season, during festival season, the demand will shoot up. And again, there will be a subside, subsidence in the demand. But if you look at investor demand, that remains quite consistent. But institutional demand depends on global events. Demand from central banks depends on how global events are taking place. If there is uncertainty, if wars are breaking out, if a recession is possible, they will buy up bulk gold reserves. Then finally, industry demand. Even this is significant. Gold is very malleable. It's, it has uh, very good conductive properties. So it's used uh, in various industrial processes, particularly in electronics, semiconductors, etc. So there is a huge industry demand as well. Right? So this is what affects the gold prices apart from the global oil prices and the dollar value. So right now what you're witnessing between gold and US dollar, it's an aberration. It's a short term mistake. Why? Why is it happening? Because of geopolitical events. Because of the uncertainty created by multiple wars. Right? The Russia-Ukraine war, Gaza war and a possible Iran-Israel war along with other geopolitical tensions from Taiwan to, uh, to China's aggression in South China Sea, right? All these events are triggering a lot of uncertainties. Plus, there is a possibility of a long-term global recession hitting us. So all these uncertainties are driving up the demand and, and as a result, the prices are shooting up uh, with regard to gold. And the dollar hasn't lost its value. Dollar remains at a higher value even now because from developing countries and, and other small economies, capital has, has taken a flight. Investors have withdrawn uh, large investments and moved towards more stable economies like US, which keeps up the value of the dollar. So it's a short-term aberration. It's a short-term mistake that you're seeing because of these global events. Otherwise, gold and US dollar have a negative correlation. It, uh, it's an inverse relationship. So understanding the concept is very, very important. You can get a prelims question, right? It's very much possible or maybe a detailed mains question as well. 
So now let's head towards the prelim section and take a quick look at the smaller articles in the newspaper. On the front page itself, the Hindu carries um, an image um, which looks quite apocalyptic, right? It's the eruption of a volcano in Indonesia. Mount Ruang, which is, which is very uh, volcanic, it's very vulnerable uh, for such volcanic eruptions. It sits on a, a very active seismic zone, right? It has erupted releasing large quantities of lava, uh, toxic gases, including sulfur dioxide. Already the area around uh, Mount Ruang, right? It has already become quite dangerous for uh, flights. The airspace here has been shut because the particulate matter which is released, it is very deadly for aircrafts if they fly through it. It can even result in uh, air accidents. So entire villages have been evacuated, lakhs of people. Right, because Indonesia is very densely populated. So large scale evacuation has been done and a tsunami alert might also be issued because the lava which is flowing down, it can, it can push the, the water, right? And it can potentially trigger a tsunami event or a tsunami like event. So there is possibility of a tsunami alert being issued as well. So that's why it's important to understand where is Mount Ruang located? This is mainly for prelims, right? So Mount Ruang, which is a volcanic mountain. It's located in Indonesia, in North Sulawesi Island. Indonesia is made up of many small islands, Sumatra, Sunda, ja Javad, etc. Right, Bali. So one group of island is the Sulawesi group of island present over here, and it's in North Sulawesi. Here you can see the satellite images of the SO2 emissions, sulfur dioxide emissions from the volcano. Right, it has already spread to a large area, causing significant air pollution as well. It can contribute to global warming as well because greenhouse gases are uh, ejected during volcanoes. And more importantly, there is a, a big risk for human life. So it has triggered evacuations, a possible tsunami alert is also likely. So please know that it's a strato volcano located in North Sulawesi in Indonesia. All right, now, also understand that Indonesia is very vulnerable for volcanoes and even tsunamis and even earthquakes because it sits on the Pacific Ring of Fire. The Pacific Ring of Fire is this uh, circum-shaped uh, region around the Pacific where you have multiple plate boundaries that exist. Multiple tectonic plates are interacting here. You have the Indo-Australian plates, the Philippine plate, the Pacific plate, the Eurasian plate, the North American plate and other minor plates as well like the Horn de Foucault plate, the Antarctic plate, Nazca plate, the Cocoa plate, Caribbean plate. So multiple tectonic plates interact here. There are multiple subduction zones where the plates are sliding against each other or diving under each other or even drifting apart from each other, causing the formation of trenches, uh, archipelagic islands etc. So along these plate boundaries, so witnessing volcanoes, earthquakes and even tsunamis is, is very common because of the active tectonic activity taking place here. So this whole region, right, which is prone for volcanic eruptions and earthquakes is called the Pacific Ring of Fire. Next article on uh, page number three, it refers to two very important uh, topics there is a reference to the National Green Tribunal, the NGT, and there is a reference to forever chemicals. Both the topics are very important. Trust me for your prelims, both are very, very important. According to the article, the NGT has looked into the issue of water pollution in Chennai's water bodies. And in a particular case, it has pointed out the risk, the hazard, the environmental hazard posed by forever chemicals. So let's understand what are forever chemicals and what is NGT, what is its role and structure. See forever chemicals is a name given to certain persistent chemicals. Those chemicals which don't degrade easily, right, which don't decompose, they remain in the environment for hundreds of years, for thousands of years. So these are persistent pollutants and extremely hazardous for the environment. So forever chemicals refers to the PFAS category of chemicals, per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, right? It's a 
man-made synthetic chemical that is persistent in nature. It does not decompose, it's, it does not uh, break down, it is almost indestructible because of its carbon fluoride bond, which is one of the strongest uh, chemical bonds that we know. So these forever chemicals, they have a lot of industrial applications. For example, they are used in your non-stick pans, in water resistant textiles, in fire suppression foams. So please note down the applications, UPSC might ask you. Forever chemicals like PFAS category of chemicals, they are used in these industries. And these chemicals have been released as well. They leach from all these products. They have been uh, released unscientifically without proper uh, wastewater treatment. And it is present in every ecosystem. It's present even in the polar areas today. It has entered the food chain because it accumulates. It accumulates through the food chain. Traces of forever chemicals has been found in breast milk. It has been found in various organisms. And it is a huge health hazard. It can cause cancer. It is carcinogenic. And it can affect various physiological functions, causing liver damage, high cholesterol, reduced immune response, low birth weight, etc. Is that clear? So that is why forever chemicals are hazardous, extremely dangerous. It's an environmental risk. Now, to deal with persistent organic pollutants, there is a convention. All right, I want you guys to find out which is the convention dealing with POPs. Since we are talking about persistent pollutants, I am giving you an assignment. Find out what are persistent organic pollutants or POPs and there is a global convention to deal with POPs. Find out which convention is that and mention the answer in the comments below. Now coming to NGT, it is a statutory body created by the NGT Act in 2010. The parliament passed the National Green Tribunal Act in 2010 to ensure that environment related cases and disputes are disposed quickly with the right expertise. Because see our judiciary is already overburdened with cases and as India's economy has been growing uh, at a very fast rate in the last 30 years, we have been facing many environmental problems. India's uh, economic rise has directly contributed to economic uh, environmental destruction, right? There has been destruction of forests, destruction of wetlands, massive pollution. So environmental problems obviously increase when there is rampant economic growth. So environment litigations were increasing, environment related cases and disputes were increasing and the judiciary was not able to deal with the burden, right? Because judiciary is already overburdened plus environment related cases requires expertise. It requires certain specialization as well to handle those cases which a regular judge may not be able to handle. So that is why a tribunal was set up a national green tribunal as a statutory body through the NGT Act. So this brings the required expertise and specialization to deal with environment related cases and it helps in fast tracking those cases. So it provides for environment justice. It provides for protection of environment while balancing the needs for growth because growth and environment protection are usually contradictory, right? So NGT aims to strike a balance here and under the spirit of Article 21, NGT was established because Article 21, which is a fundamental right, right to life, that includes your right to a clean, healthy environment. So to fulfill this right to the citizens, the NGT Act was enacted and it was established in 2010. So this specialized tribunal, it sits in multiple locations. Its principal seat is in New Delhi, but it also has seats or benches in Bhopal, Pune, Kolkata and Chennai. This is another important fact. So all environment related litigations are brought up here. It has the powers of a civil court and the structure is very important. It has a chairperson. There are members appointed, expert and judicial members. So it will have a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 20 full time expert members and judicial members. So expert members are those who have expertise in environmental issues. Then judicial members are from the judiciary. They are drawn from the judiciary to bring the legal expertise especially those who specialize in environmental laws. And the chairperson is usually a retired Supreme Court judge. Right? In consultation with Chief Justice of India, the government, central government appoints the chairperson. They have a term of five years. They are not eligible for any reappointment to ensure that uh, they are unbiased and their integrity is protected. Right? And uh, 
the members are recommended by a selection committee and they are appointed by the government of India. So this is the composition, a chairperson with judicial and expert members, minimum of 10 and maximum of 20 full-time members. So NGT does a very important job in dealing with these environment related cases. Next, we have another article on page number four that refers to geofencing. Let's understand what is geofencing. Because according to the article, the website of Election Commission of India is geofenced. It's not accessible from other countries. The article says that the website of Election Commission of India can be accessed only within India. If you're in another country, let's say in US or in UAE, you are blocked from accessing the Election Commission's website. So the report says maybe it's because the website has been geofenced to ensure that foreign actors can't hack into the uh, servers of uh, Election Commission and manipulate any electoral data. Most likely, Election Commission has geofenced its website. So what do you mean by geofencing? See, geofencing is basically creating a virtual boundary. Right? In the cyberspace, you can create virtual boundaries and it can have multiple applications. Now, for example, let's say, uh, let's say in, a, in a corporate company, right? you can ensure that your employees are sitting in office when they apply attendance. How can you do that? You can do that through geofencing. You can ensure that the employee's mobile phone is linked with uh, the office network and office network can tag the location. Right? Let's say you apply attendance on your app. On a, on a particular app on the mobile phone, uh, there could be a technological feature which detects your location from where you're applying attendance. You can't sit at home and apply attendance. Automatically, it will detect that you're not in office. So such a virtual boundary which is created, right, for an industrial purpose, for a commercial purpose, or for certain security purposes, that is called geofencing. I'll give you one more example. Let's say a truck company. Now the company wants to ensure that the truck drivers are not misusing the trucks and driving somewhere else. So they can put a virtual boundary. They can ensure the truck gets disabled if they cross the virtual boundary. Let's say uh, the truck company is in Karnataka. They want the trucks to remain within Karnataka. So they can set Karnataka as a geofence, as a virtual boundary. If some truck driver is trying to enter another state without uh, permission from the company, automatically the vehicle can get disabled. So that is geofencing, right? Then even for prisoners, let's say those who, have, those who are placed under house arrest, Right? If the authorities have to ensure they don't leave the property, they don't leave the house, they can put a tag on them, maybe a RFID tag, create a virtual boundary, which is, uh, let's say, a few meters that uh, corresponds to the boundary of the house. And if this criminal is trying to, let's say, get out or escape from the house, automatically it triggers an alarm. So that is also geofencing. So similarly, even for cybersecurity, geofencing is a great tool. You can ensure that foreign actors can't access your servers, your websites by making it geo-specific or location-specific. So such a technology is called geofencing, creating virtual boundaries for serving an economic purpose or an operational purpose or a security purpose. That is called geofencing. So technologies used here are GPS for location uh, mapping, RFIDs for uh, identification and detection, Wi-Fi and cellular data for network connection. So by using existing technologies, you can create these virtual boundaries and apply it in different scenarios and in different contexts. Next, there is an article that refers to something called the Codex Standards. This is another important topic because right now, food safety has become a concern. Food safety and standards has been hitting national headlines and global headlines because many of our food processing industries, they are misleading you, right? You might even be aware of popular influencers like uh, Food Farmer and others who have raised awareness about uh, the ingredients that they are adding, the high sugar level, the high salt uh, level, the high trans fat level in various processed food items, right? So food safety and standards has become a very important topic. And there is an article here related to that. The popular company Nestle, which also produces uh, baby formula milk and, and baby uh, food, this food which is fed to infants, right? Reportedly, it has very, very high levels of sugar beyond admissible levels, right? So there are WHO standards here with regard to salt intake, sugar intake and, and fat intake. But companies are breaching the standards blatantly and they have a, have a, a hypocritic position as well. There is a big 
uh, hypocrisy that they that they follow that in some European countries, in developed countries, they don't violate the norms. They strictly follow the standards. But when it comes to developing nations and other countries, they breach the standards. They, they, uh, they chase profits when it uh, comes to compliance. Right? If you look at the same formulation, in Europe, the formulation is different with low sugar levels matching European food standards. But in India, sugar levels are higher. In even poor countries, let's say African countries, sugar levels will be higher. You can see that with many other commodities. Let's say you look at chips and various uh, snack items. In India, palm oil is largely used by the food processing industry, which is very hazardous. But they don't do that in other developed countries. They use um, proper refined oil, but not palm oil. Right? So you do find these double standards amongst various food processing companies, which has come under scrutiny. So according to a report by a Swiss NGO, Nestle is guilty of deliberately adding high levels of sugar in its baby food product, in its baby food formulation. Not just in India, but in other countries as well. And this is in breach of WHO standards, which is based on the codex standards. So UPSC might ask a question on codex standards. These standards were established by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN along with WHO. The World Health Organization and Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN together brought out the Codex Standards, also called Codex Alimentarius. It's Latin for Codex Standards or Food Standards, basically. There is a commission, a global commission to implement this as well, the Codex Alimentarius Commission, CAC. So in India, we have the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, FSSAI, established through the FSSAI Act. So these are some basic facts that you should know when it comes to food safety. Now, next article is with regard to a new definition that WHO has brought out with regard to airborne transmission of pathogens. The article says WHO has defined pathogens that transmit through air. This is a big development. WHO has categorized, it has categorized a new terminology, a new ter uh, official terminology has been brought out, right? It basically calls some of these airborne particles and pathogens as infectious respiratory particles, IRPs. It's a new term that WHO has coined and defined. It helps in defining airborne transmission of pathogens. Because see, if you remember during COVID-19 pandemic, right, when COVID-19 had broken out, there was a lot of confusion on whether it is spreading through contact or it is airborne. If you looked at media reports as well, even they were misleading because WHO itself had not clearly defined what spreads through contact, what spreads through airborne transmission. So now, to avoid any such future confusion about airborne transmission of pathogens, it has come out with a new classification, a new terminology called infectious respiratory particles. So it refers to those pathogens which can get airborne and transmit through the air. So for example, COVID-19, sars cov two, then even uh, uh, measles, right? Some of these pathogens which cause the diseases, they are airborne. So what do you mean by airborne transmission? Let's say I'm infected with uh, a certain pathogen, a respiratory uh, disease. So when I cough or even when I talk, when I, when I sneeze, right? The droplets that is released, if they take off in the air, right? If air takes away those droplets and, and uh, transmits the pathogen to someone else. So that is a case of airborne transmission. It's not direct transmission, right? The pathogens might remain in the air. It might remain hanging in the air and someone else who might walk through the same place, right? They will come in contact with the pathogen and it essentially means the pathogen transmitted through the air. So respiratory droplets getting transmitted through the air, being airborne, is the category of airborne transmission we are referring to. It also includes dry, direct transmission. Let's say an infected patient sneezes, right? And the respiratory droplets directly fall on the mouth or nose of another person. So they will get infected. So that is direct transmission. So both direct and airborne transmission are classified under this category, that is infectious respiratory particles. So this will help in clear communication in the future. Because during COVID-19, there was a big uh, confusion and miscommunication that was happening that COVID-19 is uh, respiratory or not. 
right? How is COVID-19 exactly spreading? There was a lot of doubt regarding this. And to clarify that, to ensure we prevent such occurrences, WHO has brought out this classification. So on this note, I would like to bring my discussion to an end. So please take up the practice questions. Both questions are very important. You can write an answer and post the answers in the comment section below. So I hope you guys have understood everything. I hope you have liked the session. If you did, please let me know in the comments. Don't forget to press the like button and subscribe to our channel. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.